once again to another edition of Good Books. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Kurt Whipple. He has been in the financial planning field for over 30 years now. He's a certified wealth strategist and a certified estate planner. In 1986, Kurt founded his financial firm, C. Curtis Financial Group, in the basement of his home under a bare light bulb, and today, C. Curtis Financial Group in Plymouth, Michigan, is in its 26th year of business, where Kurt works with his staff of 14 and managers close to $300 million of client assets. Kurt and his wife, Connie, have been happily married for 33 years, and they are blessed with two children, Kelly Michael Donahue and, and Christopher Liz Whipple, and the two granddaughters, and I can't read that, Isley and Nora Donnelly. Well, Kurt, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you. I appreciate your uh, having me on, John. This is a, a, a very readable book. It's very easy to understand, and that's something because the stock, market's, stock market in particular is sometimes uh, confusing, and I really want to get to fixed interest annuities before we're done with this interview. But this is really a book about how to navigate retirement in the 21st century. And the book is entitled Retiree Lifeline, Strategies Your Broker or Advisor May Be Missing. Um, it starts off talking about inflation and taxes and all the horrible things that have gone on in the economy and the likelihood that inflation is going to spike upward in the future. How important is that to the overall picture? Well, John, it's very important, especially for people who are nearing retirement or in their retirement years. And the reason being is because if inflation takes off, then the buying power of their dollars uh, diminishes quite a bit. And they end up having to take more money out of their portfolio to be able to meet their uh, daily needs, which then uh, uh, creates the question of, will my money last the rest of my life, or will I outlive my money? Mm -hmm. You know, I have a small trust fund that my father uh, saved all these years. He was a buy-and-hold guy extraordinaire. I don't think he ever sold anything. I think he always bought and held on to everything he invested in. And that worked well for him. Uh, But it's a changed world, isn't it? You know, it really is. Uh, ever since the 1990s, starting around the year 2000, things have changed. And for the last 14 years, 13 and a half, 14 years, we, we, we've had a different economy because what we're finding nowadays is we live much more in a world economy than we do a U.S. economy. Uh, you know, Greece can sneeze and all of a sudden the stock market crashes. You know, Russia invades U- Ukraine and uh, the stock market reacts. Uh, So with the modern Internet and Twitter and Facebook and everything else uh, where we have instant communication around the world, we now live in a different uh, uh, situation than we did during the buy and hold years of the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, after spiraling down in the crash of 2008, one of the things we've been doing is printing a whole lot more U.S. dollars, and that's not good for the overall picture either, is it? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, my wife looked at me one time and she said, you know, Kurt, she said, uh, I I get confused sometimes because I listen to the radio or TV and I hear millions, billions, and trillions. And after a while, it just kind of goes right over my head. I don't even know what that means. So I decided to look it up uh, to help people put it in perspective. If you take a trillion seconds on your wristwatch, uh, that equals 32,000 years. Not a trillion minutes, a trillion seconds is 32,000 years. Our country is $17.5 trillion in debt. Um, we are, we, we've printed close to $5 trillion of new money, which devalues our currency and makes it worth less money in the long run. And uh, ultimately, it's very inflationary by printing that much money. So you try to put in that perspective, gosh, $17 trillion of debt in a trillion seconds is 32,000 years. It kind of puts it in perspective. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the situation, and now you have you have some some well balanced guidance for what to do about all that. And uh, let's just start with uh, an important question that you almost never get asked by your broker, and that is, uh, you need to look at what you want out of life in retirement. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, so many people uh, who come in to my office, uh, people who are new for the first time, I might ask them the question of, well, you know, uh, how much how much income do you need in retirement? And many times they still don't know. Or I might ask them, uh, what are your dreams? What are your goals in retirement? Do you want to travel? Do you want to be able to help your children or your grandchildren out with a college education? Um, And it's amazing. People uh, actually spend more time planning their two-week vacation to Disney World than they do planning their 30 years of retirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's really important to first find out what it is you want, because then you can start working backwards to what you need to do to obtain it. Mm -hmm. I I do want to make a note in that chapter, too. You mentioned something about how you tweak one thing, and suddenly taxes fell to zero for one of your clients. That's a pretty interesting notion. Yeah. 
Well, the biggest mistake I see, well, one of the big mistakes I see uh, people in retirement make is that they want to live off the interest of their portfolio. Um, and, and I understand that. You know, you, you built up all this principal over the years, and now you want to protect the money you have and just live off the interest. From a tax standpoint, though, that's the worst thing a, a, a retiree can do. Mm-hmm. And the reason being is because uh, that income is now 100% taxable. If I can give you a quick example, I had a forty-five. A couple come in, they have $45,000 of income, of which 25000 was social, social security income, and 20000 was interest income off their investments. Uh, what I did was make a phone call to the insurance company that happened to have the investment they owned, and I was able to split that up to where we were able to turn 97% of their cash flow into tax-free income just by making that phone call, mm-hmm. which, interestingly enough, dropped them below the taxation value on Social Security. So now they didn't have to pay any tax on their Social Security, and their standard deduction covered what little bit of tax might have been necessary. So they went from about $2,800 of taxes every year to zero, and all I did was make a phone call. That's great. And and while we're on that topic about living off the interest, I want to make the distinction between uh, uh, investing in a pre-tax plan like a 401k, 403b, IRA versus a Roth IRA and going ahead and paying the taxes be- before it goes into the account. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the Roth IRA over IRAs or 401ks. Now, if someone has a 401k or 403b or 457 plan where the employer is matching any of the contribution, they should always invest up to the match because that's free money. They're doubling their money and regardless of where that money comes from, it, it's worth doing. So they should do that. But uh, what I see uh, many people do as a mistake is they will overfund their 401k uh, beyond what the match is. And really, that money above the match should be going into a Roth IRA. Uh, because when you get to your retirement years, it's critical you have three types of money. You should have some money that's in a taxable position. You should have some money that's tax deferred. And then you should have some money that's tax free. If you have some money in all three of those categories, I can do magic with income to reduce taxation. And certainly if we reduce taxation on income in retirement, that makes money last longer, which makes it a more secure retirement for people. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about some of the danger signs of a retirement plan. Uh, you mentioned that the stock market crash of 2008 fell 37% and many people lost 50, 60% of their portfolio. Uh, some of the indicators there are things we need to pay attention to. And the first one is uh, one that I've been guilty of both sides of this either looking at your accounts every day or don't look at them at all. Right. Yeah, in in 2008, when I'd have uh, any new people come in to see us, uh, one of the first things they'd say is when when I see the statement come in from my broker, I just throw it in the corner. I don't even open it because I'm just too nervous to look at what the balance is. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, like you said, uh, other people sometimes uh, look at it every single day, and then they panic the first time they see any kind of a retraction in the value of that money. So there needs to be a system set up whereby people get regular reviews. I recommend that you look at your accounts on a quarterly basis. I think quarterly is is more than sufficient. And if you're talking about any kind of investments tied to the market, which I call red money, um, then in that case, you really don't want to make too many judgments unless you have at least a year in that account, and ideally two or three years to judge if it's really a good account or not. Mm -hmm. What about the broker who says, uh, just hang in there? What do you have to say about that? <laughs> in, one, in, one, in one of my uh, writings, I put in there a picture of a person sitting back, and it's actually a skeleton sitting in the chair. And, you know, how long do I have to hold on? You know, how long do I have to just hang in there type thing? Um, the, the, if a person has a proper plan in place, they will know what their minimum uh, or what, what they can handle and what they can't handle. And my personal feeling is that any time you start to lose, uh, you hit that negative 10% number, uh, you, need, you need to move on and do something different. I think you, uh, protecting your downside, especially in retirement years or even in the years coming up to retirement, is so much more critical than how much money you make on the upside. Mm-hmm. And um, so 10% is kind of a rule of thumb, but it may not be the same for everybody. And so I don't want to make too much of a general statement and have everybody think that's true of, of, of every single case. Mm-hmm. 
You have an indicator that we're going to talk about more when we get to red, blue, green about the portfolio tied too much to Wall Street. But I do want to discuss the dependence on bonds because this is something that I don't think a lot of people are aware of, how bonds have an inverse relationship to interest rates and um, the issue with inflation coming up. Um, There's a lot of risk in investing in bonds as you're, you're to protect you against hard times. Yeah, there really is. And, uh, you know, th- that that stems from the 80s and 90s. Really, ever since about 1981-82, we've had an unprecedented history for the last 30 years of falling interest rates. Um, my mother's 94 years old. She said, Kurt, I've never seen interest rates this low. You know, banks paying one-tenth of one percent on a savings account and a half percent for a CD. Uh, it's, it's unheard of interest rates. Well, we're now in a situation where with the government printing money, as you just stated, that's very inflationary. And I believe the only way the government's really going to get out of the debt trap that they're in right now is to inflate their way out. If you go back through all of history, virtually every nation all the way back to the Roman Empire, uh, when they've gotten into a debt problem, uh, they've inflated their way out. Uh, Right now in the United States, you could tax every citizen in America a hundred percent of their income and you're not going to scratch the debt so uh, raising taxes could be one solution but it, it can't be the only solution and that means that inflation is going to be coming it's just a matter of when um, and uh, what bonds do is when interest rates go up as you said uh, bonds uh, fall in value and i believe people are going to see bonds fall fifteen to twenty five percent in value in the coming years because of rising interest rates and uh, in the 80s and 90s, people just, and even in the last 10 years, uh, from 2000 to 2010, people be, thought, started thinking of bonds as their safe haven because we've had nothing but periods of falling interest rates. And a lot of people are going to be shocked when all of a sudden their bonds start losing a lot of money. So they need to be very careful about that. Mm-hmm. Um, a typical pie chart, is it looks sort of like mine, uh, about what you generally see your advisor offer about 60% stocks, about um, 10% cash, and about 30% bonds, I think it is. And right. uh, that's that's typical, and that's what I was sort of looking at most of the time I've been in, in uh, my retirement plan, and that's really not a good idea. <laughs> well, right now it's it's a very scary idea. Mm-hmm. If, you're, if, if, if you have most all of your money in stocks and bonds or mutual funds or variable annuities, Mm-hmm. Those are all accounts that uh, should we have rising interest rates and in, in the market uh, uh, take a take a dive, uh, those are all going to be losing money. And then you say, well, I've got ten percent in cash. Well, yeah, but the cash might be earning two percent at that point. You know, mm-hmm. so if ninety percent of your account is losing money and ten percent is earning two percent, that doesn't uh, spell a very good result. And uh, so, therefore, it's it's important that people properly diversify their investment portfolio and and uh, I just see far too many people putting too much faith in Wall Street at this time mm-hmm. and uh, the scariest chart I saw in the book was how losing money in the first five years of retirement could destroy your financial security what if what if we have losing years the first five years you're in retirement yeah and, and uh, what people don't understand is you have two sides of a mountain here I call it the accumulation side and the distribution side so if your listeners would get a picture in their mind of a mountain And on the left-hand side of the mountain, you know, the word accumulation, put a flag in the top saying, okay, this is where I retire at the pinnacle. And then on the right-hand side of the mountain is distribution. The the problem with many people in retirement is they spent their whole life on the accumulation side of the mountain. And now all of a sudden they transfer to the distribution side of the mountain, which is a totally different perspective on investing. And, but they're still investing according to being on the accumulation side. Mm-hmm. And that's where they take too much risk, and they end up losing money in those first five years. But now, in addition to losing money, they might be pulling money out of their portfolio to subsidize their retirement income. And when you're taking money out plus losing money, it's a compounding effect that ultimately causes people to run out of money uh, a little too early. They have too much life uh, left at the end of the money, so to speak. Mm-hmm. There's a useful tool in the middle, and I'm not done with my homework yet because I have to look up some things, but there's a 14-page uh, questionnaire that you would probably use to, if you had a client come into your office, you would probably interview them using these questions about um, the ideal retirement and wh- what assets you have and whether you own a home and how much it's worth. I mean, it's just it's really useful to think about all of those things that you have before you begin to plan what you're going to do in retirement, isn't it? You have to have a benchmark. You have to have somewhere that you start from. 
and until you do an, in, an inventory of where you're at and then, then identify where you want to be, uh, it's almost impossible to draw the map from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. So you have to know those factors. Okay. So let's look at red, blue, and green money a little bit. Uh, we talked a little bit about red money already being the money tied to Wall Street, the most popular investments. Mm-hmm. Let's distinguish yeah, this. Yeah, uh, red money is the four things I mentioned, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and variable annuities, and that means they, they have downside risk associated with them. Uh, many people think they have a variable annuity. Uh, they've been, uh, they're been they safe, and that's, that's kind of a myth because a lot of advisors are selling them as safe instruments because they have what is called an income rider on them that pays 5 or 6%. But that is not your money. Your money can actually lose in a variable annuity. So people might want to check with their advisor on that if they've been told different. Mm-hmm. Blue money is something that we call alternative investments. These are things that do one of two things. Either A, they pay a very solid, steady yield uh, over a period of three to five years uh, without being a bond, uh, or they're uncorrelated to Wall Street which might, a good example of that might be gold and silver or real estate, mm-hmm. things of that nature. Uh, and then green money is safe. It has some form of guarantee to it, be it bank FDIC, be it the, uh, uh, the treasury bills or treasury bonds, or if it's a fixed interest or fixed indexed annuity, uh, which really creates, uh, it has some strong guarantees on the downside to protect the investor against losing. When you have a proper diversification in those categories, then you can weather almost any storm the market brings your way. But what we find is that almost every new person that walks in our front door will be 80 to 95% in red money, Yes, which means they're tying their entire future to the fortunes of Wall Street. And to me, if you're on the distribution side of the mountain, uh, that's just way too much risk. Uh, to carry you through retirement. Mm-hmm. And, y- and your model of a diversified portfolio is almost a third, a third, a third, isn't it? Or well, it, it differs for everybody. And, and one of the things that we're very, very big on that we just feel too many advisors miss the boat on is they never help their clients identify what rate of return do you need to be set for life. So if you take all the current assets that somebody holds and you take the income that they need uh, and, and inflate that over the next 30 years of retirement, so to speak, then we come up with, okay, you need 3.5% on your portfolio and you're set for life. Well, if somebody comes in and they need 3.5% interest to be set for life and they have 80 or 5 or 90% in Wall Street, my question is why? Uh, you don't need Wall Street to average 3.5%. You can be a lot safer. On the other hand, I could have somebody come in who needs 8% or 8.5%, in which case then they're going to overweight the red, maybe underweight blue and green, but somebody who needs 3%, they're going to overweight green and maybe underweight blue and red. So it's not always a third, a third, a third. It's, all, it's custom for each individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's something you emphasize greatly here is that there's not, there's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, but the, the balance of the portfolio was surprising to me because I've never, never been advised that way. <laughs> but my biggest education came about fixed interest annuities. Let's talk about that and the, the pluses and minuses about that. Uh, an FIA is something that basically is guaranteed against loss, right? It is, uh, and it's, a, it's called a fixed indexed annuity. And the reason they use the term index is because your returns are tied to what the stock market does. However, your money is never invested actually in the stock market. Your returns are just tied to it. The first thing I want to put out, though, is that there are some people out there, some advisors who will represent these accounts as, equal to the stock market with no downside risk, and that's just not true. Uh, These accounts, really, a person should look at these to uh, basically average in the realm of uh, 3 to 6 percent, maybe 4 to 6 percent. Pretty much over the last 16 years, all of our clients in these accounts have hit that 4 to 6 percent average, with some actually averaging closer to 8 percent. A a fixed index annuity is designed to compete with the bank not with the stock market. Mm -hmm. And that's why I call it green money. Uh, But right now with banks paying historically low rates of return, a half percent or whatever, uh, getting four to six percent with no downside risk is is just like hallelujah time. And uh, people are are very responsive to that. Mm -hmm. They're great investments, uh, offering great security and downside protection, um, and should be considered in virtually almost any portfolio to have it properly balanced. 
Mm-hmm. When you when you talk about some of the the strengths, like you can't lose money, there there is a catch. And every now and then I say, well, the catch. I knew there had to be a catch, but it doesn't seem that bad as long as you have a balanced portfolio. There's, I mean, it seems like it should it really definitely should be a part of that. Uh, yeah, money. the the catches are twofold. Number one is that uh, these these products are mostly seven to ten year investments, so it is a time deposit. <clears throat> Excuse me, similar to buying a CD in the bank as far as timing goes. Um, uh, but what's unique about these is they do give you a 10% free withdrawal option uh, each and every year. So if somebody put $100,000 in, they can get at $10,000 of their balance whenever they need it each year. Um, but if they get out more than that 10%, there, there would be a uh, surrender penalty for early withdrawal. Uh, but like you just mentioned, um, if you have a properly balanced portfolio with green money, blue money, and red money, there's plenty of liquidity in other areas that should somebody need uh, emergency funds or should somebody need uh, to, to be able to get a, get at a significant amount of cash, it's always going to be available. Mm-hmm. And uh, the green money really is the foundation. If you think of it like building a house, the green money is the, the basement or the concrete foundation or the slab. The uh, blue money are the walls that uh, kind of surround the house, and then the red money is the roof. Mm-hmm. But uh, if a fire comes along and burns down the house, you want to have that foundation there that it doesn't wipe you out. Mm -hmm. And let's go back to a reference we made earlier to Roth IRAs versus the other kind. You talk about taxing the seed versus taxing the harvest, which I think is a a great metaphor to use for that. The harvest would be the interest-bearing accounts, and taxing the seed would be uh, going ahead and paying your taxes before it goes into that Roth IRA. Uh, Uh, Yeah, exactly. if you think about it, um, you know, if, if you take a person who, let's say, has, they're 45 years old, they've got 20 years to go until retirement, and they're putting away $6,000 a year into an IRA, they're going to get a tax deduction if they're in the 25% tax bracket of tw- uh, $1,500, which is 25% of 6000 mm-hmm. So over 20 years, uh, they're going to save uh, in the realm of about uh, $30,000 in taxes. Um, however, the 6000 a year they put away over that 20 years uh, has grown, let's just say, to a half a million dollars in that time. Uh, if that's the case, now they take out uh, an interest income off that. Let's just say the interest income is um, $40,000 a year to make it easy on me. Mm-hmm. But now if they're still in the 25% tax bracket, they're paying $10,000 in taxes to get 40000 out. Well, 30 years of retirement at $10,000. They've paid $300,000 in taxes by taxing the harvest when they pull it out versus uh, paying uh, $30,000 by taxing the seed. So the government wins when you uh, put too much money into these deferred programs. Mm -hmm. I had a question here about under or tax the seed thing, and maybe I just didn't read carefully. I have a question mark, and I said I asked him to clarify. Um, You talk about... um, any company can allow you to payroll deduct and place the money in savings or checking to maintain the idea of saving with, like your 401k you ask the HR department to withhold a certain amount you wish to invest and send to your bank account uh, and then right. you can set up an auto draft where each month the bank gets the deposit and I guess that's because many of us if, if we if we have the money in a place where we can spend it we'll spend it is that basically yeah. what we're yeah. human nature okay. yeah <laughs> Yeah, 401K is the biggest advantage to a 401K is payroll deduction, and you get used to not having it. Right. And the uh, next thing you know, you turn around, and 20 years, 30 years later, you have this great asset to retire on. Just had a phone call from a gentleman this morning, and um, his entire portfolio was from his 401K. He had $600,000 from his years of working. So, uh, you know, that's an example of that. Um, the, 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 that's the pro. Well, you can still do that. Just ask your HR department to... Uh, direct deposit the same amount of money into your bank account, and then you can get almost any investment on the planet to go into that bank account and pull out the amount you want them to pull out each month to put into that investment, just like it was in your 401k. There's just one step in the middle. Instead of going directly from your employer to the investment, it goes from your employer to the bank and then to your investment. Mm-hmm. But you never miss it because as soon as they put it in, the, the, the investment company pulls it out, and it works the same way. Um, there's some good tips in here about avoiding income and estate tax, but I did want to touch a little bit on gold and especially rare coins because you have a nice treatment of that in, in terms of uh, dealing with inflation. Um, sure. Gold is still good. 
Oh, yeah. No, I, gold has uh, been beaten up over the last year and a half, two years. Um, but you have to look at where you believe we're going to be going. And if I ask people this question all the time, do you believe interest rates five years from now will be higher or lower than they are today? Unanimously, never had one person say they'll be lower. Everybody says they'll be higher. Well, if we see inflation, if we see interest rates going up, that's going to be good for gold. And I do believe that gold is going to, uh, once again, have a, a, a very large surge in value. I can't tell you when it's going to start. I don't think it'll be this year. It might trickle up this year. But the big gains in gold will probably come somewhere in the next uh, two to four years. Um, but I do believe gold has the ability to triple over the next five years. Wow. Uh, you, you mentioned high-grade rare coins. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, high-grade rare coins have a proven track record. If you go back to uh, 1980, 81, during the inflation era, uh, where we had massive inflation, bank CDs were paying 16% interest. And some people say, wow, the good old days, you know, but mm-hmm. inflation was higher than that, so you were still losing money. Uh, coins actually went up, uh, top graded, high grade rare coins went up 1,100% in just two years. That means if you had $10,000 in these high grade rare coins, <laughs> You now had $110,000 two years later. So I usually recommend people consider these as kind of like a little insurance policy against your red money. That if, um, let's say I had uh, $200,000 in Wall Street, well, if I put uh, $20,000 in a high-grade rare coin and uh, Wall Street falls apart and inflation takes off and interest rates skyrocket, uh, and we once again repeat 1980-81, there's the potential of that coin being worth $200,000, which could totally replace my Wall Street investment. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a good little insurance policy. I only have about two and a half minutes left. I wanted to allow you to touch on uh, this last chapter about your success in the end and your relationship with God, and also to make your offer to our listeners. So uh, take over the mic. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for that. Um, You know, I... I, uh, (laughs) Uh, the chapter is called How I Became a Success, and uh, I found that a true success is somebody who reaches out and serves other people, and it's not all about self, it's about helping other people, and um, I found that by uh, finding a relationship with God, and uh, uh, he became a very important part of my life, and uh, is a daily part of my life every day, and um, as such, um, life becomes uh, about not just about what I can get, but about what I can give. And, um, you know, uh, people have always asked me in the past, Kurt, if I come to talk to you about my investments, is there a minimum? And I've always said, no, I, I, because someday I believe I'm going to stand before God. And if God looks at me and says, why didn't you help Sue and Joe? Uh, I don't know how to look at them and say, well, they didn't have enough money. So that's kind of always been my answer. So. Um, I appreciate you offering me to share that. And uh, one thing I'd like to do for your listening audience is offer them a free copy of my book. Um, it's, a, it's a nice hardback book. It's on Amazon.com for $17. For anybody in your listening audience, John, uh, today, I'd like to give them a website to go to where they can get the book for free. Now, I do want to make it clear, I, d- I do ask for four ninety five shipping and handling. Uh, but a uh, $17 book, and they'd be uh, paying shipping and handling of 495 I think they'd find it a great investment in value to them. I'm sure. So uh, they can go to retirelifeline.com. It's the same title as the book, www.retirelifeline.com, and there they'll find the ability to be able to order that book, and we'll get that shipped right out to them uh, for 495 Anybody who's thinking about retirement or who is thinking about their security, Uh, or who's already in retirement can benefit from this read. It's a very easy read, Retiree Lifeline. We've been talking with Kurt Whipple, the author of that book. I'm your host, John Cook. Remember that uh, that, uh, audiobooks.com, our underwriter, uh, supports us now, and we are on four times a week on KMBH. And if you don't catch us there, you can catch us on our Facebook page, Good Books Radio. Thanks for listening.